Uh, we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Bharti Meghur, who is a consultant in retina and uvea and also a proficient cataract surgeon from Meghur Eye Care Center, Bidar. So she has another very meticulous surgery to show. So let's hear from her. On to you, Dr. Bharti. Good evening, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah. This is the right eye of a 50-year-old gentleman. We can clearly see typical onion ring appearance of a posterior polar cataract. This patient is scheduled for a toric lens implantation. I inject dispersive OVD followed by the cohesive OVD. I am careful in not pressurizing the anterior chamber. I am aiming for a 5 mm central rexus. Sizing and centration of the rexus is quite critical in postpolar cataracts and understandably so as we might need the anterior capsular support to capture the optic in the event of a PC tear. I am using low bottle height, low flow rate, low vacuum and power. The superficial cortex and epinucleus are removed with low parameters. Careful inside-out hydrodelineation is done. As expected, the nucleus is soft. A central wrench is made. I am using the second instrument to cheese out the lens material. It is coming in bits and pieces. The soft endonucleus is eventually consumed. Before removing the handpiece, OBD is injected into the anterior chamber to prevent it from shallowing as the phaco probe is removed. We have a central bowl of epinucleus and cortex. Fishing it out of the capsular fornices can be challenging. I prefer to use visco dissection to separate out the epinucleus and cortex from the capsular bag. Using OBD, the epinucleus is displaced away from the capsular fornix and is gently aspirated out in a very slow and controlled manner. Using bimanual irrigation aspiration cannula, I remove the remaining cortex. The epinucleus and the cortex removal consumes much surgical time as we need to be extra cautious and the chance of breaching the posterior capsule is quite high. All the while, parameters are kept low. OVD is injected each time before removing the irrigation cannula to prevent shallowing of anterior chamber. Maintaining the anterior chamber equilibrium is the golden rule to follow in these cases. This is probably the most important step which minimizes the occurrence of the PC tear in such vulnerable eyes. Slowly but safely, all the cortex is removed. Thankfully, all is well till now. However, there is a small central plaque sitting near the visual axis. It is not getting displaced with OVD. I try to nudge it with the dialer and posterior capsular tear happens. The anterior vitreous face is still intact and there is no vitreous disturbance. The tear is oval and at this point, I am considering doing a primary posterior rexus. After some deliberation, I went against the idea of a posterior capsule rexus for two reasons. Firstly, the tear was oval and the risk of extension of the tear didn't seem likely. Second reason being the possibility of a breach in the anterior hyaloid phase while doing a primary posterior capsule rexus. I use cohesive OVD to form the anterior chamber and the bag. The toric lens is gently implanted into the bag. Most of the OVD is removed slowly and carefully. There is a possibility of little OVD left behind the lens. The IOL is dialed to the predetermined markings using the dialer and the irrigation. Side port hydration done. These are the post-op pictures. Patient is doing fine and the lens is well centered and the alignment is also good. To summarize, with this case, it is quite demonstrative that by following the right strategies, one can minimize the chances of posterior capsular tear or anterior hyaloid rupture in eyes with posterior polar cataract. The principles of low flow, low pressure surgery along with maintained anterior chamber equilibrium will allow us to achieve the goal of minimizing the complications in such vulnerable eyes. Thank you. Wonderful surgery, Dr. Bharti. And I think uh, there was everything, uh, everything just exactly there. done, exactly the way exactly. it should be. But assuming that the situation was a little different because that's how we have to go ahead with it because you've done it all. If there had been a vertical split, which is uh, possible to occur in these polar cataracts, 
and you had a toric IOL in your uh, uh, plan. So what could you have done, Dr. Dwarthi? Uh, there are two options, ma'am. One is to uh, abandon the idea of uh, putting a toric IOL and take a multi-piece lens and do an optic capture. The second option is to do a posterior capsule optic capture with the toric lens with the haptics being anterior to the optic. So the optic will be behind the posterior capsule and the haptics are anterior and the alignment can be placed according to the uh, predetermined markings. I'm not so comfortable with the second. Uh, yes, yes, yes. No, that is the, that's the other option, the way to uh, go ahead and do this. Anybody has anything to add, Dr. Ramuti? Yeah. Oh, did you get a ASOCT done, Dr. I mean, it was a beautiful surgery, wonderfully demonstrated, but uh, uh, did you have the any idea about the intactness of the posterior capsule? Because what I noticed was even before the PC rent occurred, there was some lens matter in the anterior which, is, which tells me there was an inherent defect over there. Exactly. So in spite of the fact that there is a plaque over there, maybe especially since you're contemplating a toric intraocular lens, I would have not just left it as such because most often when you try to peel it off, you end up with a rent. Thankfully for you, it just remained confined to that space. Most often, as Chitra was mentioning, it spreads in the uh, from end to end. And uh, one good thing is that the orientation of your tear was such that uh, the haptics was at 90 degrees to that. So in these cases, even if there was an end-to-end tear, maybe you could have still placed the lens in the back, even if an anterior vitrectomy had to be done. Otherwise, of course, that option of uh, what you mentioned just now is also there where you place the haptics in the back and create an optic capture and stabilize the lens. But uh, I feel if you had had an ASOCT done, you might have uh, realized that uh, there is a defect in the posterior capsule and the peeling off that uh, plaque would have ended, ended up in this situation, but you could have avoided that maneuver. Exactly, sir. Actually, I can I could have planned for a AF capsulotomy later yeah. uh, instead of trying to venture Quite out. Thick, uh, yeah. yeah. Quite thick. Yeah. yeah. These plaques have to be removed, you know. Uh, uh, can I add one thing, Chitra? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, it was fantastic uh, to see Deepak and Bharti's uh, videos. Really, <laughs> what a lovely video. I just want to know, see, one thing uh, I would have done differently from what you have done, because there is a, it's a, there was a small oval tear on the posterior capsule, but uh, it's not like a typical PPC tear, like posterior polar. It's usually like two pillars, like what Chitra told. But this is a tear because you remove, try to remove the plaque. Okay, now when you, when you put a lens, I will not put the lens in the back straight away. So I will probably put the lens in the anterior chamber, and then tuck it inside. Exactly. What I saw that you try to put the bag, um, uh, leading haptic into the bag and dial the trailing haptic. If you try to dial it itself, it can extend. Okay. So what I do is normally I put the, I use a good viscoelastic like Halon or even disco whisk and then inflate the chamber very nicely and then put the lens in front of the iris or in front of the anterior capsule. Then I use a Kuglin hook, then tuck the, um, what do you call the leading haptic as well as the trailing haptic. I don't dial it inside. Once I know it is in the bag, then I slowly bring it into the portion because being a toric lens, we have to bring it into the axis. So Actually, Another important thing is with the PCR there and you place a toric IOL, even viscoelastic removal becomes yeah. challenging. Yeah. How to remove it from behind the IOL. So that oh. is the challenge, yes. I think I might have done what Dr. Bharti did because she did mention that you know she used helon and that really pushes the uh, posterior capsule quite by, behind and gives you enough space to maneuver. And as you could see, it was a very confined uh, central opening. And good thing about this is that as she also showed in the video, helon will just float as one bolus. I mean, just uh, she went behind the uh, lens and immediately I'm sure most of the material came out. If we had used a dispersive viscoelastic. That would have been more difficult to do. Yes. All wonderful points, well discussed. So, Dr. Kapil, shall we move on to the next? You have anything to add?